Even though we are located in different parts of the world, I would like to formally begin our event today by acknowledging that the University of British Columbia, Vancouver is located on the traditional, ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. We here at UBC are very grateful to be able to carry out our work on this land. Today's conversation with director Alvin Zhang is part of the City Reassembled series, a series of seminars, conversations and associated events, including screening, to explore the past, present, and future of the Hong Kong diaspora. This conversation and the series in general is organized by the UBC Hong Kong Studies Initiative and is co-sponsored by the Department of Asian Studies, the Department of History, the Center for Chinese Research, the Center for Migration Studies, Asian Canadian and Asian Migration Studies, the UBC Public Humanities Hub, and the Interdisciplinary Histories Research Cluster. We are very grateful for uh, the support of our colleagues here at UBC. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Helena Wu, who is Assistant Professor of Hong Kong Studies at the Department of Asian Studies. Uh, Dr. Wu, Wu teaches and conducts research on Hong Kong cinema, literature, and culture, and is the author of, among other works, The Hangover After the Handover, Places, Things, and Cultural Icons in Hong Kong which was published by the Liverpool University Press in 2020. I would now like to turn it over to Dr. Wu to introduce our guest today. Thank you, Leo, and thank you all for joining us today. It's my pleasure to present our speaker, Elvin Zhang, the director of Reunifications, documentary we have screened for this very special occasion. Elvin is a filmmaker and artist based in New York City. His works explores the more personal human experience to inform on bigger issues such as humanism, community, and migrations. In the past, he had worked with fellow filmmakers on projects that address African diaspora and Asian American experiences. Currently, Elvin is developing a new documentary when home is elsewhere. He's also collaborating with artist Siyan Wong on her art exhibitions titled Five Cents a Cane, making visible the invisible, aiming to shed light on the people, mainly immigrants and elderly, who must collect canes and bottles for a living. So you can find Elvin's detailed um, biography um, and more information about his project in the chat. Um, so, um, so now I will kick off our discussions with a few questions I prepare for Elton. Um, then we will open the floor for a public Q&A session. We encourage you to post comments and questions in the chat anytime so that we can address them in the second part of this conversation. So um, Elfin, thank you for joining us today. And of course, for giving us a chance to show your work. I have watched your film for more than once at different times. I found the film very engaging, very contemplative. It embodies such a personal journey to one's past and one's family's history. It tells us how people could develop different emotional responses um, to the migration experience, diaspora and identity. And they also react differently to the notion of home, even when they embark on this journey at the same time, and even after the physical destination has been reached for some time. So I believed at the time when the migration wave is again observed in Hong Kong, um, the documentary as well as the psychology and the memories captured by the film um, speaks to many of us um, even more. So. Um, as Elvin, you wrote in the filmmaker's note, um, the documentary took you on and off 17 years um, to make. So in the documentary, we can also see like video footages like um, taken as early as in Los Angeles in 2000, okay? So as an opening question, Elvin, could you tell us about this idea of turning your experience into a film? When and how did you come up with this idea? Yes, uh, I want to thank you, um, Professor Wu, 
uh, Professor Shin and um, uh, Hong Kong Studies Department and all of the uh, departments for um, that's working together to make this uh, event possible. Uh, yes, uh, thank you all for having me here. Um, so the process um, goes something like this. Um, I graduated from UC San Diego in mm -hmm. 1998 uh, with the visual arts degree. And then um, soon afterwards, um, I found myself um, uh, confronting with, with bouts of uh, depression and anxiety, mm -hmm. which I didn't know why at the time. And then I started um, journaling for the first time in my life, uh, writing down pretty much all of my raw emotions, mm -hmm. um, anything that just came out. And it was a very spontaneous um, you know, experience. And uh, at the same time, um, that was the time uh, when digital video or DV had just mm. came out, as well as the nonlinear editing system um, on computer. Mm. So it was a very, very exciting time in filmmaking. And um, like, you know, many film students at the time, um, I also loved watching a lot of French films, French New Wave films. and. Uh, studied uh, Japanese cinema, and of course, you know, I also got into, uh, as a Hong Konger, you know, I also got into films by Wang Gao Wai. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember um, watching Happy Together in a mm -hmm. small little art house theater, and I was just so mesmerized by the, the grains, the rawness mm -hmm. of, of, of the way it was shot by, you know, Christopher Doyle. Mm -hmm. and the, the handheld aspect of it. And, and also, I, I really loved uh, Wang Gaowei's, um, his uh, very simple and direct writing mm -hmm. uh, for Tony Leung's uh, narrations throughout the whole film. Mm -hmm. And um, it, and, then, and and I was really inspired by, by these aspects and it, it really made um, a young filmmaker like me mm -hmm. uh, 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 feel like I can create something intimate with with a mm. camera, also. So, so at the time, I um, I remember I bought myself a, a digital A camera, which is uh, equal to it's equivalent to a DV camera, and I just started playing with it, uh, capturing many moments of life uh, without mm. any particular direction. You know, it was cheap to buy tapes, and it was in a way it was sort of like journaling you know, mm. with a pen, but with a camera instead. Mm. So I capture scenes of friends, you know, I capture scenes of my family life, like, like in the film, you, you saw the, um, the scene of my newborn uh, niece mm. uh, at the hospital in uh, Los Angeles. Um, at that time, I was living with my father in LA and, um, and I began filming him doing things around the house, like cooking and reading newspapers. And I eventually ended up asking him, uh, about the divorce with uh, my mm. mom and uh, why our family left Hong Kong to come to America. And mm. uh, these two questions were the, the most basic ones for me. You know, mm. that it's, uh, there's, they're questions that I, I've always wanted to mm. know the answer to. And uh, so with a, a lot of scenes um, at hand, I um, started editing them and and um, and I tried writing narrations, mm. and uh, so I would say I edited about maybe four hours of of different scenes mm -hmm. and just put them together and uh, show them to a few friends, and they all told me that um, the one storyline that really stuck out was my family story. Mm -hmm. and that I should uh, focus solely on it. And uh, at the time, I didn't believe it. And uh, I doubted myself thinking, you know, mm -hmm. why is my story unique? You know, who who care about my, who, who would really care about an immigrant family, you know, especially in this country, you know, um, you know, the family, um, immigrant family story, you know, and, and, um, that's one, I would say that's one reason why it took 17 years, because uh, much mm -hmm. of that time was spent just very slowly realizing that uh, my own story was indeed uh, worth telling. And, uh, and 
for me to admit to myself that I needed to make this film and and I must mm. be respected. You know? So it naturally became a uh, documentary in a personal reflective form, mm. uh, which uh, having finished it allowed me to gain a sense of closure. Mm. Uh, so yeah, and I needed to come to terms with my childhood history mm. and the, the traumas associated with it and to also learn to be compassionate uh, with my parents' experience mm. uh, by um, trying to probe as gently as possible in order to, to understand uh, what they went through. Mm. And uh, in terms of writing, uh, what began as you know mere journaling eventually just became mm. more and more focused and composed throughout the whole process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and my, my goal was to, um, it went through a lot of failures, you know, in, in writing, but I just kept at it. And then eventually the writing condensed into a, you know, a simple mm -hmm. and direct and hopefully, you know, mm -hmm. uh, as honest of a format as possible. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I, I so the writing is also kind of like, no, 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 totally. I mean, it, it is really like an empowering experience that you are telling us, like through documentary filmmaking, and also through video journaling and self writing. So uh, when you mention writing, it's also the voiceover that um, is it part of it, like um, in your film. And so, how did your family respond to the documentary? Well, as uh, I was making it, um, I didn't tell my parents that I was making mm. a documentary because at that time I didn't know my myself that I was making mm. something. I just needed to ask them some questions and I just told mm. them that I'm doing it for myself, uh, which was true because um, I just didn't feel confident that I was making a film. Mm. So, so in the case, so in that case, I was just, um, gathering footage for mm. uh, maybe for the future and and mm. indeed I, I did end up making a film so uh, both of them of course uh, wanted to talk about why they immigrated why we immigrated to the US mm. uh, but of course you know when the issue of the divorce came up um, you know my dad was very open to talking about it but mm. my mom as you saw um, she completely shut down and um, didn't want to answer. And uh, it was a very, very uh, difficult mm. um, uh, experience to interview her because, because uh, I felt this sense of disconnect uh, with her uh, for many years because there was a conflict you know, between mm. us children and our stepfather, David. Mm. And it, it took many years to, to reflect on it and, and uh, gain closure, um, you know, in mm. through making this film. So um, uh, I, I did tell my sister, you know, uh, I showed my sister my mom's interview, and because mm -hmm. I, I couldn't get through to my mom, and so um, I went down to San Diego, and I showed my sister uh, her interview, and she was very insightful, and I just mm. just immediately turned the camera on on her, even though she was lying in bed and mm. and so I just started um uh, and and she t she gave me good advice and she she uh allowed herself to step into my mom's shoes and mm. and give me her point of view um, and she really saved the film because um I was stuck for a long time on mm -hmm. in terms of how to finish it and her wedding in Hong Kong mm allow the film to finish because because it just opened up such a beautiful moment mm -hmm. of um, kind of reliving our past by mm -hmm. going to Sa Tin, um, just me and her mm -hmm. and just hanging out at the at the playground that we used to play in and so the the film came full circle um, mm -hmm. from, from that trip um, um, yeah so when, um, yeah, so I find it very striking is like, even when I was watching the film for the second time, the psychological dimension really like strikes me a lot. I mean, the film captures so well the psyche of different like um, 
you can say interview subjects and actually they are your family and showing the parallels and contradictions. Um, so um, when they know that the film would be going out, so um, how did they react to, to the release? Like uh, watching the finished like versions, like? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that was a, a big question for me mm. on how to reveal that the film is out. Yeah. So of course, when the film came out in San Diego, my sister came. Um, my, I, I must say that for my father, he never saw the film. Mm. I never told him about the film mm. because I, I think I'm still, because uh, he, um, there, there was a sense of trauma in him mm. in, in his life that he never dealt with. And so it's, mm. uh, I, I talked to my sister a lot about this and, and mm. uh, we think that it's very hard to let my father know mm. um, about it because um, it might bring him to a place that, um, that would mm. uh, make him sad. So in a way mm. we're, we're um, very protective. Um, and, and in the new film, you'll see what I mean, because mm. uh, I explore the, the trauma, uh, mm. his trauma while growing up. Um, my mom, um, what happened was I, I brought the film to Hong Kong, to the Hong mm -hmm. Kong Independent Festival. Yeah. And all of my relatives from my mom's side live mm. in Hong Kong. And so, of course, I had to tell my mom because all my mm. relatives would come and see it, uh, which they did. And they all um, enjoyed it. <laughs> and yeah. and uh, I had to tell my mom. And so, um, of course, uh, yeah, that was the, the time when she first uh, opened up a, a Facebook account. Mm -hmm. And so she knows exactly, you know, everything that was going on when I was sharing mm. the film on my reunification page. And she would like everything, mm. and um, you know, all of my relatives would would like everything, and then she would um, make a disclaimer, write a disclaimer saying, um, you know, uh, you know, me and David uh, really did our best to raise uh, the children, mm. and um, and so so yeah, so that was mm. that, and uh, but I. I but she didn't see it until uh, two years ago when she went back to oh, okay. for her 50th anniversary mm. for, for her high school. So she saw it. Uh, a friend of her uh, was a, is a social worker. So I mm. think she might have had a talk with her. But mm. I think ever since um, the film came out and she, you know, and, and she know about it, um, our, I feel like our, there's a, a, a weight that's been lifted. So mm. I'm very... Um, happy about that and my stepfather I, I I even feel like our experience our relationship is uh, much better now and mm. we become we can become more honest with each, with each other mm. yeah yeah so so the film also served as a bridge to yeah. in a way right to the past memories and also the present so actually following this, I'm I'm very intrigued by your use of color and black and white effect in the film and how you just oppose them. Like um, I can cite one of these scenes, like, um, so you have actually like footage just taken in your father's apartment in Los Angeles, like in 2000 and it was in black and white. And then like in one scene following that you show us like um, family photos um, in color. And there's also another example and um, you were interviewing your father um, in his apartment, um, in black and white, and in between the, um, the conversations, you show us like um, this um, green booklet, the certificate of identity issued in Hong Kong, and it was in color. So uh, are all these like conscious choices of yours and and how do you make the decisions like between the use of color, black and white, and sometimes happy at home? Yes. Uh, yes, I like to uh, juxtapose mm. the now and yeah. the past. Mm. And so I used um, the two colors. Mm. Um, so I, I wanted to give a kind of a bluish black and white tone um, mm. for the scenes with my father. 
Mm. Uh, it is a very emotional choice for me mm. because I felt uh, uh, with being uh, while being with him, living in Hong mm. Kong and also living in LA after I graduated, I felt a a sense of like loneliness and isolation mm. in both of us um, while we're we're living there in those two places. And for the uh, reddish uh, sepia tone. Um, which is, you know, a warmer tone um, uh, that I used um, uh, for the uh, my my uh, the scenes of my newborn uh, niece at the hospital. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to convey a sense of warmth and mm. a sense of like uh, a renewed hope, you know, associated uh, with it. And and so the uh, so both the bluish black and white and the sepia. Um, mm. I tried to establish the uh, kind of uh, like the opposite spectrum, spe opposite mm. ends of how I felt, you know. And um, the use of color is more neutral and um, and, it, and it's more in the present. And, um, mm. and I guess in a way, like I, I wanted the film to go from being stuck in the past and mm. slowly through into the present, you know, which is the color. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I believe we also get that sense, especially when you, it is about um, your sister wedding. So we actually have yeah. like this like really vivid full color, and it is amazing. It also show how kind of like memory kind of like is being processed and also being represented like in, in different colors and spectrum. And so following this, um, I have a curiosity concerning the title of the film, so reunification. So I found it's very intriguing. Um, so could you perhaps tell us how you come up with this title? Like, how do you interpret yeah. it, for instance? Yeah. Right, right. Um, yeah, of course, you know, there's mm. the idea of, uh, you know, reunification and handover, right? Mm. Uh, right. When it comes to um, mm. Hong Kong's return to China, mm. right, in 1997. And so it's, uh, I chose, the, I actually play with handover as a working mm. title at one point, but yeah. I feel like um, this is a personal story. And, and I want to use the, the title to convey mm. the, my experience, right? Of uh, how I see mm. the family, how I see our immigration. And so I feel afterwards, I felt that, um, you know, reunification is just a proper, title because mm. for me I use uh, for me a reunification is a personal choice it's mm. a, it's a cathartic choice you know mm. and it's about coming full circle and uh, gaining a sense mm. of closure from mm. having reflected on the past through uh, understanding yeah yeah and um, so for me it um, it wasn't really, I didn't think about the politics of it too much, mm -hmm. you know, like, I just feel like, um, yeah, it's just a, a personal mm -hmm. choice. Yeah. yeah. I really like how you articulate um, past memories in the documentary, like, yeah, like through voices, objects, images, and like, like family images, and also kind of like um, images, like footages, like news footages of the actual handover and also the mediation and the interactions. And especially how you include the frame of the TV when you show the handover. So turning it into a very like mediated and mediatized events on multiple levels. So yeah, I find it like very intriguing. And so um, in terms of the, the naming and the use of color, like do you have a different take when looking back at the film, let's say in the present moment or anything about the film in general? Uh, do I have a different, what, I'm sorry? Take, like, do you have a different, like, um, ideas of these articulations, like, when looking back at the film, mm -hmm. at this moment, for instance? Yeah, um, well, um, I show the film to mm -hmm. many audiences, different mm -hmm. types of audiences in New York and different uh, public libraries mm -hmm. and universities um, in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And so I met, a, you know, people from all walks of life who so generously, you know, share their own experience mm. uh, as immigrants, 
And so what I find from these what, six years of um, showing the film is mm. that uh, many of our experiences are very similar, you know, when it comes to mm. immigration, you know, uh, we have to um, sacrifice, a real, we really have to sacrifice a part of ourselves um, when we immigrate to another land, you know, even when you have a lot of money and you're able to mm. immigrate, you still cannot, um, run away from the the challenges of of like mm. of culture of assimilating mm. into a new culture mm. and how like you would still feel a sense of uh, foreignness you know in, in a new mm. land you know? and so i i really um feel like um it's uh this the, the just just um the that we, we are so connected mm -hmm. and any of our experiences, especially mm -hmm. nowadays with Hong Kongers, like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, it's, I'm sure they're going through, mm -hmm. you know, uh, some sim similar uh, mm -hmm. aspects to my experience as well. You know? mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm very curious to hear from all of you, you know, what, what you know, what yeah. you guys think or, or share your stories of, of your own immigration journey. Yeah, so yeah, we like so yeah, for our audience, yeah. So please feel free to put your comments and also questions in, in the chat. We will be opening the QA in, in a moment. Um so um so my last question for Elton actually is that you work on several projects in the theme of migration, diaspora and memory. Um, you also work on projects that talks about African diaspora, um, Asian American experiences. So how do you observe these relationships between the self and the old and new homes? So from your own experience and also from different interview subjects we encountered throughout the years. Mm -hmm. um, yes, um, I think um, I, I see the, mm. well, having made this film alone, mm. you know, um, and, and also, you know, having gone through, um, you know, therapy, which was necessary mm. for me personally, you know, um, I, I see the need for the self to reconcile with the past uh, in order to move on and live peacefully uh, in the present. Mm. And when I, I find that when, you know, when a person had experienced trauma, you know, he or she uh, needs to deal with them, you know, and so um, currently, you know, I'm working on the new film, uh, which is the, mm. the sequel to Reunification, entitled mm. When Home is Elsewhere. And the film, you know, looks at my father's life mm -hmm. and how he is someone who has not dealt with, um, 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 he has not dealt with his trauma since childhood. And um, yeah, he was born in Vietnam and both of his parents died before he became a teenager. Mm -hmm. And as a teenager, he, uh, he as a teenager uh, growing up in the 50s in, in Saigon, um, he went in hiding uh, from military police, uh, capturing young boys to, uh, to train in the military for the war, uh, I guess, getting ready for the war in the 60s. And so he had to uh, quit school because, because of that. And um, when he was 17, uh, he escaped on a boat to Hong Kong, and this was where he met my mom, and they had mm -hmm. us siblings. And so this uh, film explores the the feeling of home and uh, what it means for someone who's now in the 70s to not having yet uh, found a sense of home, a um, mm -hmm. a sense of security and uh, permanence, which to me is what what home is. Um, yeah and um and yeah. yeah so maybe we can also show the video you brought to us today so which is your work in progress shall we sure. yes yeah. please He scavenges wherever he goes, never accounting for aesthetics. 
This empty space gives the sense that one had just moved in and is now ready to fill it with things that are solid and permanent. Perhaps something beautiful. But for him, his possessions have somehow become more and more temporary and disposable. That time when I was shooting my first film about my family while living with him in Los Angeles 20 years ago. He still had the couch and table that was given to him. And that time when I went with him to Vietnam after he had just moved into this senior housing in San Diego, he still had some basic furniture which he had built from scratch. He used to travel with this proper suitcase, which he found. But now... Panda, panda. Panda Chinese food. Oh, Panda Express. The more he strips away the physical from this space, the louder and more unbearable the echo gets. Okay. So, thank you so much for sharing with us this um, work in progress with um, with our audience and um, and for those who want to know more about um, Alvin's new project uh, to support the project so you can find more information in the link um, I just put in the chat okay um, I think like Alvin's documentary and also um, reunification and also the sequel um, Where Home is Elsewhere eloquently tells us that the expert experience could be shared but at the same time, it is very distinct and very personal. And so I think this is um, perhaps a good time to move on to the next part of the conversations, um, the public Q&A. Okay, so, um, so please feel free to um, put your questions and comments um, in the chat and we will address them one by one. Um, so let's take a look. So. Um, so I found uh, Su and Su and Yao is our um, um, lecturer in film studies um, at the University of UBC um, of British Columbia. Um, Su and, do you want to um, to come forward and ask your questions? I'm I'm fighting a cold right now, <laughs> so I think I'll leave my question in the chat if it's okay. Um, but I found the, I'll just say very quickly, this perspective of looking back, mm. but also of wanting to deal with what is life in the present. These two approaches is very, was very striking to me. And uh, I'm wondering if you can talk about this kind of tension between nostalgia and practicality a little bit more. Thank you. Mm. Yes, um, yeah, I hope we, you feel better um, from the cold. Uh, yes, um, yeah, I, I feel that, um, yeah, as much as, um, I would just speak for, for my folks um, that, you know, my family seem to be very practical, you know, and e maybe even a lot of Hong Kongers, you know, I, I see a lot of practical um, practicality in the way we handle things in life, you know. Um, 
like you know preparing food you know wonton mean you know <laughs> on the street and just uh, there's that practical sense you know that of everyday life um, but at the same time I feel like we Hong Kongers are, are also very nostalgic people you know like uh, uh, I talked to a lot of my friends from Hong Kong uh, uh, and even people uh, from the older generation and we are very nostalgic and um, and, and for me um, every time I go back to Hong Kong I always wanted to go back to my old neighborhood you know I always wanted to relive it by going back to mm. Saatian where I grew up and just sit at the playground for hours and um, to kind of bring myself back to those moments of, um, of uh, as a peaceful child you know who um, and and uh, and of course you know when I you know went when I met up with friends or my family, uh, we always go to those place, those particular places mm. to eat, you know. And so it's um, I, I really feel a sense of nostalgia in, in Hong Kong, just the just the idea of um, um, like coming down. Like my my grandma used to live in San Juan on the hills and. Uh, just the sense of like coming up and down the hill, uh, I feel a sense of nostalgia. Yeah, and um, I I don't know if it answers your question, but um, I feel like it's it, there's a sense of practicality, but the, there's also this uh, this this sense of romance, you know, which is mm -hmm. in in that form of nostalgia that um, that 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 I feel. This actually reminds me of um, the objects that you focus on, mm. like um, your films, I mean, your film, like in um, reunification and also in the teaser that you just showed us. So there's always the kind of like different household objects um, connected okay, to an experience or connected to a person. Um, like in reunification, you also show us um, the close up of like a fish at your father's place. Um, at your mother's place, we see a series of close up on like, like of tickling clocks, plants, um, family photos. Um, and just now in the teaser, we also mentioned the furniture viewed by your father and also um, the different things um, that he used or he does not use. Um, so um, I think like this really tapping well to what you just talked about, um, nostalgia and also um, practicality and also that is embedded with some sort of a routine and also memory making. So to you actually, um, these, um, these objects that you show in, in your film, um, what do they symbolize or do they mean something special to you? Like, would you mm. have something yeah. about that to share? Yeah, to, to uh, just mm. keep going on mm. off of what you're talking about. Um, yeah, like, uh, yeah, definitely. Um, mm. No matter how practical we, we want to be, you know, mm. uh, I think humanity just has that sense of like nostalgia, you know, and uh, we, we cannot be just efficient all the time, mm. right? Like we have to dream bigger, you know, we have to mm. open up our minds more to, to kind of expose ourselves to more, you know, the, the, or, or, or just the, that, that um, kind of good feeling about the past, mm. you know, that's very dear to you, you know, we want to hold on to that. And, mm. and then, and, and I feel like it's, it's like it's about honoring your past. You know, that's uh, mm. uh, that's very important for uh, humanity. Um, yes. And uh, for those. Yeah, I really wanted those uh, images of uh, the fish and and um, to, to give a sense of memory. You know, always mm. try to find an image that will bring you back to the memory. And so. Uh, at my mom's place and my mom and my stepfather's place, um, I showed a lot of um, like old photos and I, I would show like dusty, mm -hmm. the dusty table and uh, yeah, clocks ticking. Yeah. I really, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in that scene, I was trying to convey um, uh, memories of our uh, 
uh, hard work, you know, uh, mm. or uh, of us working hard in America and mm. uh, uh, within this kind of passage of time, you know, but mm. it, in a way it's a force in turn because, because we were um, surviving, you know, through so many years of working mm. hard, cleaning, doing our cleaning business and so forth. I, I felt that the ticking clock was kind of our survival, mm. uh, you know, uh, mechanism, you know. Mm. And so um, later on um, in the film, I showed um, a scene of my of my parents, uh, my mom and my stepfather's mm. plants, you know, growing mm. freely and abundantly everywhere in the house. Mm. So in a way, um, I try to tell a story and give a sense of of them um, going beyond the mechanical, the, the survival. Mm. And now they're actually able to live life a little bit more. You know, now mm. that we children are out of the house, they're able to to be be more free as 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 humans and and just allow things to grow. And um, yeah, so I, I try to think of um, the images in, in those mm. terms I was uh, while I was editing. So we have um, a few questions in the chat. Um, so Irene Pand um, is assistant professor of international studies at um, Simon Fraser University. Um, so um, she said, thank you to Elvin for the documentary and being so generous with sharing your family story. Your parents each commented that the motivation for leaving Hong Kong was to build with one's own hands a better life, yet there also seems to be a sense of helplessness at how much or little one can do to shape one's own life. Could you please comment a little more on this tension between the individual agency and the larger social structures? And on that note, was the experience of migration um, political related to 1997 for you? Mm, well, that's a so very, over to um, you, yeah. Okay, it's a very challenging question. Mm. Uh, yes, um, I, yes, I, definitely I, I question in the film uh, whether the 1997 was our reason for, mm. for, uh, for moving to the US. Um, my father, his answer in the film was that um, it, it wasn't, it was mainly for our education and opportunity, you know, for the children. Um, but I would think that uh, just from, just by looking at his, uh, his history, I would think that there is that sense um, of uh, fear of, uh, of the communists coming because, you know, because of his uh, uh, past experience as, an, as a refugee, you know, uh, escaping the war in Vietnam. And so I, I think a lot of it is like very ingrained in his decision. In following like your comments on the tension between the individual agency and the larger social structures, um, was the experience um, of migration political for you? So you mentioned your parents and I guess like um, she might also want to hear from you. And this actually also type into, for instance, um, this question from, by, um, from Selena Mao. So thank you, Evan, for sharing your personal family history. You mentioned as immigrants, there is a lot of sacrifices and loss. Can you go more in depth of these sense of feelings as I believe that it resonates deeply with many immigrants? Mm. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I uh, sort of blanked out for a moment. <laughs> for a moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I had to admit that um, I I was uh, cleaning up my father's place um, mm. uh, for several hours yeah. because uh, mm. recently came down with uh, COVID. Um, he mm. he he ha he's been recovering in the hospital now. Mm -hmm. So, and, and he's uh, due to release tomorrow, but uh, me and my sister, we were there at his place and, and cleaning up for the past five hours and uh, mm -hmm. I just kind of blanked out a bit. Um, I apologize. No worries at all. No worries. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so um, I think now we can, um, I will kind of like um, just um, 
mentioned a comment from Peter Kwong. Um, thank you, Elton, for sharing this. Um, he's a Hong Kong girl and he understands uh, why your dad wanted to move to USA for um, for he was in a sense a Vietnamese refugee and his roots is not in Hong Kong and so Hong Kong was not his final destination. Um, so, and um, he also shared like how he knows a Vietnamese lady who moved to the UK uh, during the 80s to join her father's family that there even she was married to a Hong Kong girl. And so I think this also like address the, the larger diasporic experience that we talked about. So um, about Hong Kong girls and also other um, or other geographical locations. And here maybe uh, we can hear from um, Professor Miu Chung Yan. Um, Miu Chung Yan, um, Dr. Miu Chung Yan is a professor in social studies at the University of British Columbia. He actually gave a talk on um, Hong Kong diaspora um, for Hong Kong Studies Initiative um, a few months ago. Um, so I believe that um, Professor Miu will have something um, to add on this discussion that uh, we have been engaging in the charts and also um, during today's conversations. So over to you, Neil. Okay, thank you, Elena. Um... Sorry. Uh, first of all, we did, you know, thank Alvin for the uh, the documentary and also, you know, um, the the answer for today's questions. I really appreciate um, how you use your family story to tell a bigger story about immigrants. Uh, in my own research, um, I also find that you know um, the life cycle needs of family members always drive the um, uh, the immigration process. Uh, very often we think people want to get a better life, you know, uh, make more money. Actually, most of the time it's because of the children's or, or other family members' well-being, they, they start the, the trans, uh, national migration journey. So my, my question to you is, um, actually, I was, uh, I find it intrigued that uh, your sister decided to have her wedding ceremony back to Hong Kong. Um, so I want to uh, know more from you um, other than your family story. Um, you also mentioned that you know Hong Kong people tend to be a little bit nostalgic. You know, sometimes you know we always go back to the same place. Uh, I have to say, okay, you're lucky because you know the the place you grow up uh, still there. Uh, the place I grew up is totally demolished. So at uh, one time I went back, I was like, okay, is is this the place I grew up? Uh, but you know, I you know I I want to ask you the question is um, how much Hong Kong uh, is you know happening with you and your family. Uh, all the time when you are in, uh, you know, more after you move to LA, and 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 what is the the experience to you as someone now living in the state, going back to Hong Kong to have the wedding? Uh, what was the meaning to you and to your family for that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, for me, um, I I haven't gone back to Hong Kong too many times. You know, I wish. Um, growing up, I wish I had gone back more because um, because I, I, I always loved it uh, there whenever I went. And so I would say since I've been here um, in 1985, for now for what, 35 years or so, um, that um, I, I, I've gone back to Hong Kong for maybe six or seven times. And each time it was like a dream come true for me to go back. It's almost like I'm fulfilling some dream that I, I wanted to fulfill. And, and, um, and so whenever I went back, it's always like living as a child um, and kind of like holding my, my mom's hands, you know, like, but, but when, I, when I went back, I was with my relatives and they would just bring us to everywhere to eat, uh, new places that pop up. And it was just so, so, um, um, just uh, rewar you know, rewarding to to go back. I feel. Um, I, I think it, it contrasts the the life of a poor immigrant here in America, where you know we children had to work for our family, and so going back to Hong Kong was like going back to childhood. It's like kind of uh, able to escape our harsh life in America, you know, and. Um, and um, this this past um, in, in 2015, when the film came out, uh, I, I went to Hong Kong uh, for the first time for for I think three months, and I I was there as an adult because uh, 
um, I, I met a lot of friends through the Hong Kong Independent Film Festivals, Festival, which uh, who really showed me um, a side of Hong Kong that I've never seen before. And I, I really appreciated it. And I was very grateful to have met these friends who I still, you know, I keep in contact with. And they're just so, so generous in, in sharing with me their own films. You know, many of them are filmmakers. And I, I just uh, truly feel the, feel the warmth of the Hong Kongers who are not my family, you know, um, and um, almost felt this like brotherly, you know, sister kinship with um, these friends. And, um, and, and, and they're very um, gentle and just very um, nostalgic as well, you know, and, and very open and, and embracing of my history and they're uh, very willing to share with me their their own um, you know life stories or or where uh, where they live and and it's just very interesting learning about the the local Hong Konger so so that experience was um, um, it, it really stayed with me and 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 um, yeah and I I really, really enjoyed, enjoyed it. Yeah. And also to add um, one question um, from the chat uh, by um, Suyen. Um, um, she's curious about, I think there's also one question that uh, maybe we all have in mind about the reception of the film in Hong Kong and in North America. So how was the audience reaction similar or different? So. I think it's also like um, going along the line that like what we're have been talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I show the film in yeah different different audiences um, mm. share with me their different experience. Um, in I remember uh, one experience that um, that stayed with me was um, I was at a New York Public Library. And many of the, um, it, it was in Midtown, and many of the uh, uh, the viewers, or or um, uh, or one of one of the audience members is a Jamaican mm -hmm. lady, and she shared with me how it, it really, um, it, and I was very uh, surprised that it uh, affected her that much because mm -hmm. I thought. You know, we're different ethnic cultures, you know. but she was also an immigrant, and she went through a very similar uh, thing with her mother, and she was, uh, she said she cried, and and that she she wished that she had the same conversation I had with my mom, but unfortunately for her, her her mom passed away, mm -hmm. and she never got to have that, that experience, that, that, that uh, conversation mm -hmm. with her mom. Um, so, um, and, and, and other people really thought that it's a, it's a good glimpse into uh, mm -hmm. what an immigrant, uh, uh, Asian immigrant family has gone through because they, they've never seen, seen it that way. They, mm -hmm. they thought, they 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 never saw the uh, the 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 poor um, Asian immigrants, you know, mm. and so they told me that it opened up opened them up to mm. how Asians are also you know in a different economic class as, as well. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and here at this point, I want to. Um, mentioned um, Professor Bonnie Afro's comment on the chat. Um, she's professor and head of the Department of History. Um, she talks about um, how your family story is a very moving one and your film gave all of us a very personal and like intimate glimpse into your family's interactions and history. You captured well some of the ways in which migrations caused feature in our life stories, ones that typically cannot be undone, even if not compounded by war or humanitarian crisis. 
you have already mentioned some of the difficulties you encountered when you uncovered the memories that were disputed or some in your family would have rather forgotten. Has this journey of discovery helped others in your family finding healing or closure or at least a greater sense of peace? This is also connected to um, one audience um, of ours who would like to ask you about your thought when you first learned that you was the one being left behind in Hong Kong. So over yes. to you, Elvin. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um... Definitely, having made this film, um, it um, really allowed um, my relationship with my parents to get closer. Um, just because, in a way, uh, I changed myself, mm -hmm. and so it it, um, the, it allowed me to unconsciously act in a, a more peaceful way, more relaxed mm -hmm. manner, perhaps that. Um, they sense it also. And so I'm not um, um, relating to them uh, with a sense of, of fear or, or anger, um, um, I would say anymore, you know. So, um, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's very freeing. Yeah, definitely. Having shared the film with so many and, and uh, also feeling their, their life experiences mm -hmm. and you just kind of feel this connection that uh, we are, you know, as immigrants, we are more alike than, mm. than you know, different. I feel more uh, relaxed towards them now. Mm. They mm. Um, naturally, you know, become mm. more relaxed to me too. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, for my dad, uh, is a much more complicated issue mm -hmm. because he has so much trauma from his childhood of being an orphan and being a refugee. Mm. And he never had a, uh, a, a parent role model to really mm. help guide him, you know, through mm. life. And so, um, it, and, and he's, he's never gone through any kind of therapy as you, mm. as you know, you know, older generation mm. folks don't really um, believe in therapy. You know, mm -hmm. they don't understand it. And so, uh, through making this film, um, trying to exp trying to uh, understand his his thinking, mm -hmm. and perhaps try to ask him questions and, and mm -hmm. probe a little bit and try to uh, get him to be uh, more aware of of his his own journey, mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully heal. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, a he, he so he um, has uh, COVID now, and mm -hmm. uh, and um, he, he in the hospital he exhibited some um, some um, uh, traits that uh, um, that kind of shows his his uh, kind of his attitude you know towards life. Mm -hmm. um, he was uh, the nurse called us and told us that, told me and my, me and my sister that he was pacing around the room because he was enclosed in his own room. He was pacing around the room and he was uh, fidgeting with bags all night. So that's very, that's his way of coping. Um, mm -hmm. And and um, and always, and, and we, see, we see that as a trait of wanting to be elsewhere. You know, he's always mm -hmm. getting in a way like getting ready to pack up and go. Mm. And that's why in When Home is Elsewhere, uh, I, I want to explore that and 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 um, con, kind of confront that and, and why he's always wanting to go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. He's not happy where he is, you know. Um, it, it's good that he's trying to minimize his, his space um, and, and to be practical, but it's, uh, to to such extreme mm. that I think he's negating um, that the 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 sensitive side of of humanity the the something the softer side of humanity um, in, in in dreaming you know dreaming mm. and he he's trying to be 
um, practical all the time, mm -hmm. um, as extreme as possible, don't want any burden, but um, how he behaves, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it makes it hard on, on him, you know, it, it's still, the truth still comes out, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, he, he always wanted to go somewhere else, you know, he wanted to be in Vietnam, um, he's, yeah, like he, he, even now, even though he, he's been in this, uh, senior apartment building for seven, eight years now, he still feel like he's not at home and, and, mm -hmm. um, it, it really, um, it, uh, uh, I would say for, for me and my sister, like we really feel for him, you know, and, and, and we, and, and my sister had talked about today to the case manager that uh, let's try to bring him a therapist, a, a emotional, you know, mental therapist to, to help him, you know, through this process of recovering for, from COVID. Yeah. So it's, um, we're, we're, we're yeah, we're, mm. we're trying. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we also like actually like um, go from reunification to your, new documentary like when home is elsewhere and i think like in at this point we, you have addressed like or you have actually tell us about like what this new title actually means to you and your father um home for being elsewhere or not being at home when you are here um so i think this is also um like um a journey that like um, we are all um, taking or uh, we try to understand um, today during the conversations um, with a lot of like insightful comments and questions from our audience and also uh, with elephants generously sharing your experience and your family's um, experience and also your psychological journey so thank you so much for that um, so um, and also we thank our audience for participating in our conversations um, I'm mindful of the time and for now I will pass um, the time to um, our host, um, Professor Liu Xin, to, to wrap up the event and also... Um... Thank you. So, uh, thank you. Mm. Thank you very much, Alvin. And, and uh, thank you. before I formally wrap it up and, and I'm mm. of time too. So this is of course particularly difficult, right? Because you just mm. traveled across the country and, and have, um, have to take care of your father. So I'm, I'm very, very grateful. Um, for you to not just sharing your film, uh, but to taking part in this conversation. So, so um, thank you. Um, I also want to thank the audience for joining us this Friday afternoon, evening. Uh, thank you for your questions, comments. Uh, thank you for watching the film. And of course, we look forward to Elvin's, um, the second film, right, the sequel. I also want to thank uh, my student helper, Sonia, for working behind the scene and designing the poster and, and all, the, all the work that makes things work here. Uh, so thank you, Sonia. I also want to thank um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Wu for um, moderating and then um, um, carrying out this wonderful conversation. Um, so thank you. So um, now, I know, I know Alvin is very tired, um, so I don't want to keep you for long, but I always find events like this very strange to just turn off and, and just disappear. So um, I think, Elvin, would you mind staying just for a few more minutes? After no, not the, at all. The event over, and maybe some of our audience, if you are interested in, in you know, if you want to say how much you like the film, I think I'm sure Elvin would like to hear that. Um, but we won't keep, we'll keep it short, right? It, I know that, that, that Elvin is tired. And, and, mm -hmm. and so um, with that, I would just say, um, I would invite the audience to join me in thanking uh, Elvin. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to share my film and my experience with you all and, and to um, hear your uh, wonderful uh, questions and comments. <laughs>